Okay, so uh, good morning. Um, indeed, I was um, a little hesitant about which precise cut to give to this talk because of the word philosophy, <laughs> which scares me. And uh, so, well, as you will see, I prepared something which goes from the very trivial, very well known, and I apologize in advance for that, all the way to something that probably nobody understands. Mm. So, there's a whole spectrum, and I hope everybody will find it. It's a uh, <coughs> place of interest in the talk. Uh, so let me give right away <coughs> an outline of the talk. So I will start very, very uh, simple and trivial, reminding you of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, how it eliminates ultraviolet divergences and classical singularities. Then I will turn to relativistic quantum mechanics, which um, actually has been mostly formulated in the language of quantum field theory. The fact that there are ultraviolet divergences, again, mm -hmm. the same. Uh, let's see. Yeah. ultraviolet divergences come back, uh, the idea of renormalization, and then I will turn to the specific topic of the conference, which is gravity and quantum gravity. So, first of all, again, classical singularities, and then the question of non-renormalizability. Uh, then I will uh, turn to string theory and to its quantum mechanical miracles. And then the, the basic point, philosophical, pseudo-philosophical point I wish to make, is that perhaps string theory uh, suggests some kind of Copernican revolution. Maybe this is too big a word. And I will illustrate this in a worked out example, which is a, a, a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment, having to do with uh, very, very high energy string collisions. So we use this as a thought experiment uh, in the good old traditions of quantum mechanics. Okay, and then I will continue a little bit, but very shortly, on uh, string theory, less desirable quantum effects. I said that there are some quantum miracles which, I will, uh, which are very welcome, but there are other quantum effects which are not as welcome. And perhaps what is uh, the weak point, Achilles' heel, of quantum string theory, which is the existence, abundance of some light scalar fields, or even massless scalar particles, scalar meaning without spin. And uh, I will end up with some comments on, as I said, something that nobody <coughs> understands how to do. Uh, quantum string gravity and the fate, I should have said, of classical singularities. Okay, so, and since uh, time is abundant, it seems, uh, please, and since I don't know exactly the, the which level of complexity I should have followed, please interact whenever uh, something is obscure. In any case, we have one and a half hours, including discussion. So if some of the discussion happens during the talk, I don't mind, actually. It helps me to renormalize the talk. OK. <coughs> so you know that in 1900, Max Planck introduced a new constant of nature, which is called H. And this was the birth of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, an extremely successful and internally consistent theory, at least mathematically consistent theory. For instance, Dirac gave a, a rather <coughs> axiomatic formulation of it, in spite of some interpretation problems, which uh, I'm not an expert on and I will not enter in. So, uh, Planck's original motivation, as you know, was the elimination of a divergence in the black body energy spectrum. If you integrate out over all frequencies of the 
emitted the radiation from a black body? The answer <coughs> is infinity. The divergence was an ultraviolet one. It had to do with the excessive emission of high frequency radiation from a black body. And now quantum mechanics cures this problem by introducing an exponential cutoff at high frequency. So the spectrum, d over d, the energy emitted in some range of frequency, uh, at high frequency goes exponentially down. And of course, there is this crucial h, which appears in the formula. If you put h equal to 0, you go to the classical theory, and there is no exponential cutoff. Now, not only other successes of quantum mechanics are well known. I will only mention the stability of atoms. Classically, a system made of a positive and a negative charge is unstable against the emission of electromagnetic waves. And uh, in a short time, the hydrogen atom should collapse, classically. And in quantum mechanics, it can live forever if it sits in its well-defined ground state. And this is thanks to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Okay, In a little picture, classically, the electron would like to, as it orbits around the, <coughs> the nucleus, uh, should emit synchrotron radiation, lose energy, like in the binary system from which we have seen gravitational waves. Except that, OK, here eventually it will end up crashing into a singularity. Um, now, quantum mechanically, as you know, the electron sits on, a, on some kind of orbit, which is fuzzy but the average distance is well defined, is the Bohr radius, and it's the best compromise satisfying the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you try to put the electron too close to the proton, you gain somewhere, but you lose somewhere else, and this is the best compromise. Now, <coughs> already Dirac was much aware of the problems that originate when you try a relativistic extension of quantum mechanics. Because relativity allows for the transformation of energy into matter and back, so the number of particles, or quanta, is no longer conserved. And, uh, and furthermore, quantum mechanics allows for energy to be borrowed for a very short time lapses, for very short time lapses is the so-called ET uncertainty principle, OK? If you want to measure the energy of a system precisely enough, you have to have enough observation time. Or rather, for very, very short time, you can <coughs> have big uh, jumps in energy. If you combine the two, uh, the relativistic possibility of transforming matter into energy and back with quantum mechanics, you find that uh, an indefinite number of quanta of arbitrarily high energy can be created for a very short time. And, uh, and this is a source of problems. How can we check this more quantitatively? Uh, well, that is done by quantum field theory. Um, the point is that dealing with creation and destruction of quanta directly turned out to be a difficult task in the, <coughs> in the old formalism of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, where you elevate you know, position and uh, momentum to operators and impose um, <coughs> the usual uh, formalism. So historically, people abandoned that formalism and turned to quantum field theory which is also known somewhat improperly as second quantization. Uh, now, what is the starting point of quantum field theory? It's a classical field theory. For instance, Maxwell coupled to charged particles, or which gives rise to what is called quantum electrodynamics, QED, 
Uh, and then one applies the rules of quantum mechanics that uh, you replace the Poisson brackets of, uh, <coughs> of the classical theory with up to a factor of i commutator. And, okay, similarly you can try to do with general relativity. You start from, you know, what you learn in books, the classical theory of gravity, <coughs> otherwise known as general relativity, and you apply the same procedure. Now, the Fourier modes of the fields become creation and destruction operators for relativistic particles, relativistic quanta. So this is how you extend to the relativistic case the, uh, the non-relativistic recipes. <coughs> However, <coughs> all of a sudden when you go to this relativistic case, uh, UV divergences emerge for the reason I already alluded to. Uh, the point is that the problem of virtual creation of arbitrarily many energetic quanta pops out again. So, and it appears through the ultraviolet divergences of uh, what are called radiative corrections. These are precisely some corrections that quantum mechanics uh, uh, predicts, which have to do with the virtual creation of and reabsorption, for instance, of quanta. And this can be very energetic quanta. So, if you want quantum field theories, at least the usual kind of quantum field theories in three space and one time dimensions, they do not have this Planck-like exponential cutoff that saves <coughs> the black body uh, spectrum. Uh, there is actually a classical counterpart to this uh, kind of divergences. For instance, if you take the electromagnetic energy of a point-like charged particle and you compute it, as, is, as you go to uh, the point particle limit, namely your charged particle has zero size, that is classically infinite. Now, uh, that is a contribution to the mass of the, an infinite contribution to the mass of a, <coughs> of a point-like charged particle. This divergence is alleviated somewhat, but is not eliminated by quantum mechanics. Say so the, the divergence, instead of being linear or quadratic, is logarithmic, but is still there. <coughs> uh, in spite of these infinities, for the non-gravitational interactions of the so-called standard model, that is at the basis of our present understanding of the electromagnetic, weak and strong interactions, the infinities can be absorbed into a finite number of quantities, okay? So there is infinities, but finite number of quantities. Now these quantities cannot be predicted by calculation. Even if you were given these quantities at the classical level, they would change quantum correction would change them by an infinite amount. So the best one can do, it's a bit of a, you know, sweeping the dust under the rug, is to renormalize the theory, which means you give up computing the above man these above mentioned quantities and you take them directly from experiments. Of course, it's not very philosophical not very satisfactory. I mean, you take a quantity, you add an infinite one, and you say, okay, the sum of these two quantities is finite and is taken by experiment. I think a much better attitude philosophically is to say that quantum field theories, the ones we use our, you know, as uh, particle theorists, are only valid up to a certain distance scale short maybe, but finite, and then some mechanism which is yet unknown, or you, know, you may have some ideas, but we don't know for sure, removes these infinities. Now, 
and then precisely a finite number of quantities will depend on the details of how this new physics regularizes the divergences. These are the quantities that have to be measured. Uh, <coughs> for instance, in quantum electrodynamics, the mass and charge of the electron cannot be predicted and has to be measured. And the same is true for the so-called fine structure constant, which is basically the coupling constant of quantum electrodynamics, the strength of the electromagnetic force. Now, the rest, in principle, is predictable. For instance, again, in quantum electrodynamics, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron, the mu, this can be computed with very, very high precision in terms of the quantities that have been measured. This is typical of a renormalizable theory, okay? You give up, if you pay a finite price for your ignorance about what happens at extremely short scales, but the price is finite, okay? It's not an infinite price. So you retain predictability, not total predictability, but Good. Now, gravity is kind of special. Uh, well, even at the classical level, it's somewhat pathological. We know that singularities pop out even when you start from innocent-looking smooth initial conditions or when you integrate backwards the Einstein equation. So, for instance, the first case is the case of gravitational collapse. You start with some system and uh, matter which under the <coughs> universal gravitational attraction gets denser and denser and in some cases it leads to black holes and uh, more often than not there is a singularity uh, namely a place where curvature for instance goes to infinity behind the horizon of a black hole. In the second category, there is a cosmological singularity. If you integrate backward your Einstein equation, starting from, say, today's universe, and, uh, and that is usually associated with a Big Bang, I think wrongly. So if you want to understand why wrongly, you ask me later. Okay. <laughs> Any questions so far? Am I going too, too slowly, eh, I guess? <laughs> okay. Uh, now, then there is a no renormalizability of quantum <coughs> gravity. The problem with quantum gravity is that the renormalization strategy that I uh, tried to explain uh, a moment ago does not work so well in the case of gravity. And the ultimate re reason for this failure is that, according to the equivalence principle of general relativity, gravity couples to energy, or energy is a source of gravity. Uh, so the ultraviolet divergences are related to high energies, high frequencies, high energies, and therefore they are enhanced by the gravitational interaction. So in the presence of gravity, this uh, virtual quanta of arbitrarily high energy are too copiously produced uh, and make quantum general relativity non renormalizable, at least by standard techniques. Which means, following what I discussed earlier, that infinities cannot be lumped into a finite number of quantities. Okay? As you <coughs> go on, in your calculation, new infinities come at every loop order, if you know what the loop order is. Predictivity is therefore lost, in principle, because okay, you need an infinite number of, of numbers to make the theory predictive. Now, another problem with quantum gravity, perhaps a little more conceptual, is that <coughs> quantization in curved space-times, at least in my opinion, it's somewhat difficult. For instance, there are quantum effects which appear to depend upon the reference frame, 
if you are in an accelerator relative to an inertial frame, while the equivalence principle would require that you know, physics doesn't depend on the reference frame. So I think, my opinion, personal opinion, is that it is probably inconsistent to quantize matter fields in a fixed curve background. Well, it could be a very good approximation, but uh, if you really want to be uh, exact, fully consistent mathematically and physically, then the background itself is <coughs> should be subject to quantum <coughs> fluctuations. It's part of the quantization. And okay, it is my vague feeling that perhaps the information paradox, uh, if you know what it is, Hawking's information paradox, could be a consequence of such an inconsistent mixture of doing something classical and something quantum. Now, there are, of course, alternative approaches to quantizing general relativity. The most interesting attempts to these states are those of loop quantum gravity, for which we have a representative in the audience. And also, there is another thing called asymptotic safety. Uh, both approaches assume that one can make sense of quantum gravity, or I should say of quantum general relativity, by modifying the way to quantize general relativity, but without modifying the, the theory itself. Uh, now, it could work, <coughs> but okay, if I take the lesson we learned uh, in particle physics, I call it the electroweak lesson, which is how people went from Fermi's theory of weak interactions to the present theory of weak interactions, which is, uh, which is the Glash-Weinberg-Salam <coughs> theory. Well, it teaches perhaps that you have really to modify the theory itself. It's not just an effect of quantum mechanics or being smart about how to quantize Fermi's theory. So for those of you, probably the minority of you that don't know, in Fermi's theory you describe the, uh, the beta decay of a neutron into a proton, electron, and an antineutrino through what is called the four Fermi interactions, namely these four particles interact at a single point in space and time. Uh, in, the new, in the new theory, which seems to work pretty well, well, there is a fact that already a fact that the neutron and the proton are composite particles. They are made out of quarks. But this is not so essential for what I'm going to say. Uh, you could have said, well, then it's the quarks and the electrons and the neutrinos which still interact at one point in space-time. But that is not the way the standard model works. In the standard model, uh, the, the quarks couple to what is called an intermediate vector meson, the W, and then uh, this W propagates a little bit and then at some other point in space and time it disintegrates into the electron and the antineutrino. So there is this displacement between this vertex and this vertex and this is what makes uh, the standard model of the glacier weinberg salam theory softer okay, and renormalizable. And people tried, I remember when I was young, before the standard model was invented, people were trying hard to quantize directly <coughs> Fermi's theory, which is not renormalizable precisely like quantum general relativity. You know, general relativity has a coupling constant, which is the Newton constant. Fermi's theory has a similar constant, which is called the Fermi constant, and uh, they're both dimensionful, 
and the divergences are very similar. So, I don't know, perhaps it's a, it's a red herring, but seems to me it's something to keep in mind. Now, then there is a second lesson from particle physics, uh, which will be at the basis of most of the rest of my talk. So, according to our present understanding of, of all interactions, if you go to a very microscopic level, quantum level, all fundamental interactions, which I remind you are electromagnetic, weak, strong and gravitational, as far as we know that's all, uh, are transmitted by massless particles of spin 1 or 2. 2 is for gravity and spin 1 is for the other interactions. Now, the first kind of particles, like the photon, a massless spin 1 particle, give rise to non-gravitational interactions. The latter, the graviton, is responsible for gravity. Now, uh, once you have these particles around, okay, for some reason, then both the gauge invariance and general covariance, which are the guiding principles <coughs> for the, uh, the standard model and for general relativity, they simply follow from the consistency of the interactions of those particles. Basically, you need enough symmetry, local symmetry, to be able to eliminate some unphysical polarizations. Because I remind you, or tell those who may not know, that the degrees of freedom of massless spinning particles are different from the number of degrees of freedom of their massive counterparts. For instance, a spin 1 and spin 2 massless particles have two physical polarizations, whereas uh, if they were massive, they would have three or five physical polarizations, respectively. So, now, could general relativity and also the rest the, the gauge theories of the standard model be a consequence of quantum mechanics. Instead of saying, you know, I, I'm given this classical theory and I'm asked to quantize it. So I call it a Copernican revolution and main, the main part of the rest of my talk is to show you that Perhaps this is what string theory suggests. Okay? Now, to the extent that string theory is right, <laughs> we don't know. So, uh, so I'll <coughs> try to summarize very briefly what uh, is. Yes? Interject a short question. Yeah. The question was uh, could be a, a concept of quantum mechanics uh, on space time, a concept of quantum mechanics on a dynamic space time, a concept of quantum mechanics without space time. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I think we, we, will, we will see. Yeah. We will see. But I mean, uh, uh, no, sp yeah, I, 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 you'll see that in string theory, I'm assuming, at least to begin with, the space time is there already. <laughs> okay, but not the interactions. I'm talking about the interactions. Okay. So, uh, but you, you will see the space time will be non-trivial as a result of quantum mechanics. <laughs> so, let me give you a, a five-minute introduction to string theory. I, I think the, the best way to answer the question, what is string theory, is to say the string theory is not my own sentence. I, I forgot who, who had this. Uh, string theory is a theory of strings. So, <laughs> by this you mean that you, you don't start with this grand principle of gauge invariance, general covariance, even the equivalence principle, no. You just assume that everything in nature is made of relativistic quantum strings. Uh, they come in two kinds. They can be open or closed, depending on whether they have ends. 
So you combine these three things, special relativity, by the way, when I say relativity, I mean special relativity, quantum mechanics, and states. And if you put these three ingredients together <coughs> and nothing else, you get some interesting outcome. Uh, for instance, uh, I want to stress the importance of the quantum here, okay? Because if you take a classical string theory, and there are classical string theories, for instance, when you talk about cosmic strings in the universe, there's no need to do quantum mechanics, like you don't need quantum mechanics to describe the solar system. So, and classical strings have no characteristic size. They have a tension, which tells you what is the amount of energy per unit length of, this, of the string. Uh, but there is no characteristic size, okay? A shorter string is lighter than a longer string, and there is a proportionality between the two. But when you go to the quantum regime, or you, you turn on quantum mechanics, then there is a characteristic length, namely a single characteristic length, and it's given by, by that expression. As you see, the, the three... Uh, the three quantities which belong to uh, relativity, quantum, and strings all appear <laughs> in this formula, the Planck constant, the speed of light, and the string tension. Okay? Out of this, you can form a length. And that length uh, is called the string length. By the way, sometimes it will capital L, some other times it will be lowercase l, uh, don't worry, it's because maybe I picked up some transparencies from other talks. So, same thing. Now, note the analogy. It's actually perfect only in four-dimensional space-time, so in our case, uh, with a Planck length, you know, the length that Planck introduced also at the beginning of last century. You know, H, C, and G Newton, which in you know, up to speed of light factors is like the inverse of a tension, okay? Now, so again, there is an analogy with atoms. I, I, I show again the figure of one of the first transparencies. Uh, okay, but perhaps even closer is the analogy with the ground state of an harmonic oscillator. Okay, because if you have a, an harmonic <coughs> oscillator potential, classically there is a, a, a ground state and, uh, and there is no spread. The horizontal axis is the spatial axis. Uh, but quantum mechanically, we know that uh, the uncertainty principle introduces a, a spread, so there is an uncertainty delta x which again is proportional to the square root of the Planck constant. So, very similar. Or, put it differently, uh, uh, without quantum mechanics, strings become lighter and lighter as they shrink. So, in the, in the classical case, you take a string and there is scaling variance, so you can rescale. If you, if you are given a solution, a classical solution, classical string motion, you can rescale everything, all the coordinates, and make and find other solutions if the, the string is simply shrunk. And the more you shrink it, the lighter it is. You can go to the limit in which it becomes a point and it will be massless. Okay. Quantum mechanically that's not the case. You, you, you have some kind of optimal size, which is given by this quantum length, and if you go this way or that way, the mass increases. Like the harmonic oscillator, you can, of course, construct a, a state in which the, the, uh, the, the little ball sits very near the minimum of a potential, but it will be a very high energy state. It will not be the ground state. Now, this quantum spreading or quantum size of strings uh, may, 
you know, changes very much the way you view interactions. Uh, in you view interactions in string theory. In, in field theory, we have seen already in this uh, Fermi or standard model <coughs> or standard model uh, diagrams that interactions take place at a point in space and time. But if you put too many fields at the same point in space time, you get these ultraviolet divergences. But if you put the right amount of fields, then you get these renormalizable field theories. But still, it's quite different the situation with strings, because now the interaction of three closed strings proceeds like this. You see, you have two closed strings which come together at some point, but where? I don't know exactly where. They become a single string. Okay, so two strings go into a single one, perhaps heavier. Uh, but the interaction is mirrored over a region which is of order this L sub s. And it is this basic property of quantum strings, the cure to the ultraviolet problems of conventional quantum gravity. In fact, ultraviolet divergences are removed altogether. It's not that you make an non-renormalizable theory renormalizable, no, you make it finite. Okay, that's the beauty. And in fact, there is indeed an exponential cutoff like Planck had in the black body spectrum. <coughs> now, the second miracle, which is even more related to the topic of my seminar, is that uh, unlike classical strings, which cannot have angular momentum without having mass, because to have angular momentum, you can immediately understand. You need some finite extension. Right? Angular momentum is the product of the distance <coughs> times the momentum. So if there is no distance, there is no angular momentum. But by the time you have, a, you have a size, you also have a mass. So in fact, in, the, in classical string theory, you can prove a strict inequality between mass and angular momentum through the tension. So this is the classical relation, there is no h bar here, but you see it prevents j, which is the angular momentum, to be, uh, be non-zero if the mass is zero. So there are no massless spinning strings in the classical regime. But quantum mechanics adds this uh, infinite sum, which is formally divergent, has to be regularized. There's only one consistent way to regularize it, and it gives a negative contribution, which allows m equals zero and j equals alpha naught h bar, and alpha naught uh, is predicted to take only these possible values. The half integers are for the super string. So, there is, so massless spinning strings are inevitable at the quantum level. I mean, in fact, in the old string theory in which I was working in the late 60s, um, they were a killer because at that time we were not trying to make a theory of quantum gravity. We were much more modest. We were trying to make a theory of strong interactions. And in strong interactions, there are no massless particles. We know, because the force is short range and so on. So, uh, but string theory was very obstinate. It was predicting the existence of these ma massless particles, and we had to abandon it. So, and that shows another interesting lesson, that string theory can be falsified by large distance experiments. You don't have to go to extremely high energy to falsify the theory. By the time you prove that there is a massless particle <coughs> in the spectrum, you have low energy experiments that will tell you whether this is correct or not. OK, now, um, OK. So 
coming back to our Copernican revolution, now instead having spin one particles of zero mass or mass spin two particles is welcome because you get a photon and other gauge bosons which can mediate the non-gravitational forces and you have a graviton which will mediate the gravitational force. And all elementary particles will correspond to different vibrations <coughs> of the same basic objects, which are open and closed strings. So this gives a unified theory of all interactions, because they are all geometrical, you know, they are all given by this little, little trouser-like diagram, okay? Uh, they come out <coughs> from some geometrical construction. And the theory is unified and finite, and it is based on quantum mechanics, okay? If, we, if I didn't have quantum mechanics, all these things would not be there. So, and quantum mechanics gives directly some quantum version of gauge and gravitational interactions, and then you can take some classical limit, uh, and you see, you <coughs> obtain the starting point of quantum field theory as the end point of your, of your construction. You start with quantum mechanics and you may end up in some limit with classical field theory. But on the way, you have also provided some short distance corrections without which the usual quantum field theories would show these ultraviolet divergences. Okay, how well am I, how bad am I doing with time? 9.30? It's all... Okay, okay. Okay, now, okay, I think up to here, hopefully I have been uh, simple, perhaps too simple, I don't know, <laughs> to you to be that. Now perhaps we switch gear a little bit, because I want to go into some more specific d details about a worked out example of what I mean by generating a classical field theory, in this case it will be a classical gravity theory, from some quantum mechanical calculation. So, and this example has to do with the trans Planckian energy collision of strings. But it will be done in Minkowski space time. So, Indeed, this answers perhaps partially uh, Carlos' question. I, I am assuming, and in fact I have been assuming all the way, that strings propagate in Minkowski space-time. My discussion was there. That's where I know how to do my quantization. Uh, so, what is a trans Planckian energy string-string collision? Well, it's the collision of two strings, which I can pick up from the spectrum, you know, from all possible uh, uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, <coughs> uh, I can fix the two initial strings as well as the energy of the collision and the angular moment, the total angular mo momentum of the system. Now, it's a very simple and pure, in the sense of quantum mechanics, initial state, Depending on angular momentum and energy, it could lead classically to black hole formation, to a possible information paradox. We would like, I mean, this was, is really the ultimate aim of, the, of this Gedanken experiment, how uh, information is preserved. Okay, or whether there is indeed a loss of information. So this was the original motivation. But for this talk, I will use it not for solving that problem, which is still not solved, but to um, you know to explain the the idea of this of this Copernican revolution. Uh, I stress again here: calculations are done in flat space time. So, but I would like to see the beauty of general relativity, in particular the emergence of a non-trivial geometry of space-time, to emerge from a calculation we, where I never put in any curved space-time. 
So this is a picture of, the, of what we have to do. Uh, these are the two incoming strings. These brings are the two outgoing strings. And as I told you, the interactions in string theory are related to some surface, you know, with holes and so on. Uh, we saw this trouser diagram, but when you go to uh, on and on, you form things. You see, I don't know if you see this. This surface is su supposed to be a, a surface with two holes, okay? Um, these are the two holes. Now, and I depicted in, uh, in red the incoming outgoing strings, and in green some closed strings that you exchange between this and this, and then yellow as some produced strings, intermediate, and so on. But never mind, uh, okay, this will give you just a feeling of what we do. So, uh, and uh, there is a, a certain parameter space in which you can study this process. The parameter space is characterized by different values for the, uh, the data. The data are the input parameter of the collision, okay, how far or how close the two strings collide, uh, is related to angular momentum and to energy by this relation. There is also a quantity which emerges, again, it's not put in, which is the so-called Schwarzschild radius or gravitational radius. Uh, here I put a generic value for the number of space-time dimensions, capital D, but, okay, think about <coughs> D equal 4, just to be simple. So G times square root of S defines a length which grows with S, of course, proportional to S. And this is, you know, like the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of mass square root of S. But, since I'm in string theory, there is also this string length, what I called previously capital LS. Sorry, here instead of the tension, I use alpha prime, which is one of the tensions. So this, this should be, should explain why. Now, this quantity, I cannot vary, okay? It's like a unit of length in the theory. But I can compare other lengths that I can tune in my experiments to this fundamental length. So since I have three relevant length scale, I will, okay, this is a technical detail, there is also a Planck length, but it turns out that if I'm in a particularly simple regime, which is weak coupling, I can consider that this length is much shorter than everything else, so I, I will put it to zero. Uh, this being said, this phase diagram depends on ratios of of this length, so since I have three, three length parameters, I can form two ratios, or I can uh, uh, put in a plane this uh, gravitational radius on one side and the impact parameter on the other side, and then you see I will mark a point here, which is the string length size. So this way look at the blue lines, you can divide your phase space roughly in three parts, this, this and this, depending on which of these uh, lengths is bigger than the other two. And uh, on the basis of some uh, uh, collapse criteria, the classical expectation is that there is a critical line, which is this red line, which separates a region in which you expect the collision not to form any black hole to from the region where you expect to have gravitational collapse and formation of black holes. And okay, the idea is to study this process in all these regions, trying also to go across this critical line and see what happens. Okay, life is a little more complicated than this. The yes. two regions, are the, also the classical theory similar? Or the, the this is the classical the theory. The I mean, the, in the just pure gravity plus matter. <coughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, no, no, 
No, the, the this is a classical prejudice. <laughs> we'll have to see ah, what okay, we get. Okay, 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 so okay. this red so line is from okay. classical collapse criteria. You can study the process of two-particle collision that was started by Hertley and Giddings and so on. Uh, you don't. The, the process is rather complicated, so you don't know precisely this curve, but roughly, you know. For instance, when you see when when b is of order r, uh, you expect to have some critical value of order one on the ratio. Here I put one just to. It's qualitative the picture. So will you explain why do you mean the stream gravity and what is the other two gravity things? Was it yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I will explain. I mean, uh, the three regimes, I call them weak gravity because uh, we will see life is easy, we can do something very simply. I, I will go through the three regions. Why? So, this is strong gravity because you have gravitational collapse. This is weak gravity because we don't have <laughs> gravitational collapse. The third one is, you see, a region in which the string length is larger than both <coughs> the, um, the Schwarzschild radius and the impact parameter. So it's a case in which th the string size matters. Because, you know, these are like big strings relative to the impact parameter. So they really crash into each other. Whereas if you are here, they miss each other, <laughs> almost piece each other. But we will see that they feel still the fact that they are. So wait on, wait, and then I think it should become clear. And OK, life is even more complicated. I don't know if I should go into this. There are sub-regions. Uh, so each region has sub-regions. And we will see them as we go on. I think maybe it's not important to discuss it now. So, uh, okay, I, I, in, uh, in particle physics, we talk about an S matrix. This is the a certain object whose absolute square gives the probability of a certain process to take place. This S matrix can be computed in this transplant and energy collision, or rather, one can argue that it has this form the exponential of, a, of some object divided by h bar, uh, where this a classical is something like a classical action. And uh, it has a leading term, which we'll <laughs> analyze in a moment, plus corrections. The corrections, see, this explains the word weak gravity, because uh, if you go to very large impact parameters, these, at least superficially, are all, uh, are all negligible. And we are left with a 1. Okay. Now, the tricky point here is that 1, as you know, is a real number. It has no imaginary part. Now, if these directions have an imaginary part, then you cannot neglect them even if they are small compared to 1. Because, you see, there is an i here. If this guy has an i, i squared is minus 1. And you get an important effect. You have a damping, a suppression of this amplitude, which means also suppression of the probability. Uh, as long as this quantity times the prefactor, which is large, becomes of order 1. So this is what gives rise to the subregions. OK, so let's start with the weak gravity regime. The weak gravity regime, we can show that the 1, the first term, is reproduced simply by summing Feynman diagrams. Uh, the string size doesn't matter. Uh, everything is simple. This so-called ladder diagrams, and there are also cross ladders which are not shown here, can be summed up. An infinite number of them, okay, you have to sum. It's an exponential series, so it's easy to do. And then the result is what I had in my previous slide, namely 
I keep only this term. Now, okay, then the question is how do you go back from this S matrix in which you keep the energy and the impact parameter fixed to something in which you want to see how, if at all, the two strings deflect each other. So you have to go from impact parameter to what is called momentum transfer. Okay, there is a transfer of momentum between the two guys. And you do this by standard method, the Fourier transform. You can do it by subtle point and at the end of the day, you discover that this really, the two strings really deflect each other, and that the deflection angle, which is given by this formula with a precise coefficient, which I didn't write, <coughs> but it's a exact <coughs> coefficient, um, it gives the correct generalization <coughs> of Einstein's <coughs> famous deflection formula you know, for the deflection of light by the sun, one of the tests, the one of the first tests of general relativity. Uh, now that formula can be <coughs> generalized to the case of the collision of very energetic particles. You don't need the sun and the photon. You also, also two photons will deflect each other if they are sufficiently energetic. And, uh, and that formula works in any number of dimensions. The other thing is that you can take the, 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 the deflection comes from the derivative <coughs> of this phase shift with respect to B. If instead you take the derivative with respect to the energy, you get what is called the Shapiro time delay. And that also comes out exactly right. OK, third comment. This process is unitary. There is no loss of coherence, but it's kind of trivially unitary. It satisfies elastic unitarity. It means that uh, there is no production of anything, no excitation of the strings. The initial state goes into itself, essentially. OK, then, you see, <coughs> still keeping in this weak gravity regime, we can go a little bit lower. I don't tell you how much lower. So we are still in this region 1, but, uh, you know, somewhat approaching either this boundary or this boundary. Now, in that case, we cannot neglect these corrections of, for the reason I told you. This is a small number still, but it multiplies a big number. And if it has a, an i, uh, <laughs> you have to keep it. And, uh, and this will take into account not uh, strangely, uh, string size effects. Remember that this L sub S is the typical size of strings. So somehow that term tells us that we are not colliding point-like objects, but we are colliding extended <coughs> objects. And the good thing is that you can do the calculations. The calculations, I will go a bit faster. Um, Remember, I had my ladder diagram where I exchange, I put some gravitons exchange between one line and another line. The transverse distance is this impact parameter. <coughs> Here, it turns out that the, the, the result can be expressed as exchanging gravitons between one point in one string and another point in the other string. And then you have to average the precise definition of averaging over which point here and which point there. Doing that way, uh, you get um, uh, you get the possibility that each each one of the two strings can get excited. And uh, the physical interpretation is more than interpretation; is really check is that a string moving in a non-trivial matrix feels tidal forces. We didn't put any non-trivial metric, but out of the calculation comes this effect of tidal forces. The tidal forces in this case produce excitations of the string. Classically they would produce deformations, you know, like the tides 
of the earth, uh, they would stretch or contract the string. But quantum mechanically, they, you see this as simply uh, making transition between one string state and another. So, and everything is consistent with the quantum information preserving unitary evolution. Now it's no longer elastic unitarity, you have to take into account that you know you start with two strings but you produce two different ones, but the sum of the probabilities of producing any kind of uh, excited strings adds up to one. And this is what unitarity tells you. And, and we have of course uh, information preserving process. So this is the picture, okay? You start with the say with two massless strings, but the yellow strings that you can produce are <coughs> typically massive. And so are the final ones. Okay, the third uh, topic is gravitational waves from these trans Planckian collisions. And this, we have, for so far, we have only done it in the point particle limit. So there are no actual strings here. Of course, it would be nice to extend it. It's a highly non trivial problem, the one of computing the gravitational waves which are emitted in a very, very relativistic uh, collision. It's so, in fact, I gave a talk in June, end of May, beginning of June here, so probably the, the slides are somewhere in the IHES uh, site. You can look for more details. So here I will be, again, very sketchy. To say that it's uh, a non-trivial problem, it's enough to show perhaps the, the, this paper by the new Nobel Prize, recent Nobel Prize, physicist Kip Thorne, uh, who, who gave up on this problem, although they solved very well a, a generic case, they say uh, that they need a condition, that the angle, the angle of gravitational deflection should be much smaller than this Lorentz factor, which of course goes to zero if V goes to C, so they cannot deal with the ultra-relativistic case. So, uh, again, this still belongs to the weak gravity regime, you know, approaching, going again in this direction. Now, uh, you can do these things classically. So, I worked on this with Andrei Grusinov at NYU a few years ago, three years ago, and we did the calculation without any <laughs> quantum mechanics. We obtained the result using the Huygens principle in the Fraunhofer approximation, which is a bit tricky because in the case of gravity, it has to include in an essential way the effects of the gravitational time delay in an external metric. So certainly in this classical theory, we heavily used that space-time is not flat. Okay, so it's precisely, so you see that the point is this, that one string feels the shock wave metric of the other string. And as a result, when they collide, there are several effects. There is the deflection, which I already discussed, but there is also a time delay, which I also mentioned, by the way. So you have to take that into account. And then you reconstruct, here I have a graph which is, uh, not easy <laughs> to read and understand. So just to give you the feeling, uh, 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 this is one particle, this is the other particle coming across with an impact parameter B, and then you reconstruct the field far away by superimposing, according to the Huygens principle, many, many waves emitted by each point on a screen, okay, on a two-dimensional screen. Now, however, these waves have their phase, and their phase has to take into account the gravitational uh, time delay. Once you do that, you get a very 
explicit formula. It's not very simple, but it's not very complicated either. It's very explicit. It gives, for instance, the energy spectrum of gravitational waves as a function of their frequency and their ang angle at which the wave goes. And uh, <coughs> it's all controlled by the so-called news functions, C. And for C, you get uh, an explicit form. Okay? And this integral d2x is precisely the integral over this two-dimensional screen from which you uh, take all the, all the waves. Okay, there are a few technical details which uh, I don't have to go into. But then, a, a couple of years later, no, one year later actually, uh, we looked at the, we, we approached the same problem quantum mechanically. Uh, and quantum mechanically, we are back to our Feynman diagrams. Uh, <coughs> this is nothing but a rewriting of the lambda diagram which I had in my previous class. It's a nice drawing, perhaps. So these are the incoming particles, outgoing particles, and these are the gravitons which are emitted. Now, and we had to improve on some previous treatments of, of our own. Uh, and a very important observation is that the usual, there is, a, there is a theorem about how to compute the emission of very, very soft gravitons in a generic process. The work by Steven Weinberg, for instance, in the 60s. Uh, but that work has to be somewhat improved because the exchange gravitons, you know, like this one, it's almost on the mass shell. I told you that there are virtual particles which are not really physical. This is almost physical. Okay. So, and therefore, if, you, if the emitted graviton comes from a, from a coupling here, it can be neglected if you really go to zero frequency, but if the frequency of the graviton, emitted graviton, is not infinitesimal, you have a contribution from this. So, we looked at this. This graviton, therefore, can be emitted at every rank in this uh, ladder or from this exchange graviton. Summing up everything, we ended up well, here there is a little technical detail, but we ended up with a formula which looked like the one, the classical one, but it was not exactly. Uh, if you look back in the, in the classical formula, this, oh, this function phi is the same, it appears here, but, uh, but, uh, but the formula is different. However, then we, we found out that we had forgotten something, that one should take into account the difference with the phase of the three-particle final state relative to the two-particle state. And when this is done, we got exactly the classical result. Of course, provided you take the limit in which h bar omega is much smaller than the total energy of the process. So this shows how we could recover. Now, since time is short, I will not go through what we get in detail. In many cases, not so much of interest for the topic of the, of the conference, but we reproduce the so-called zero frequency limit. The limit of very soft gravitons is nicely reproduced. <coughs> we can extend it to higher frequencies. We still have a, a problem that the, 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 the spectrum, d, d omega, uh, it's not sufficiently damped at very large frequencies. So when you integrate the spectrum, you get still a logarithmic divergence. And we think we understand which approximations uh, produce this bad effect. But this is 
ongoing work. We also have some nice pictures about the. So this is a very explicit result, which may need some improvement at the high frequency end. Okay, now, uh, how about short distance modification? Because so far we got things which are essentially uh, the same as in general relativity. Even this string size effects could be understood as tidal forces and tidal excitations. However, if we go to really this regime, uh, then we get really something new. You expect really deep modifications of gravity. Okay? It's like when, again, in analogy with weak interactions, if you go near the W boson uh, energy, you know, the, the predictions of the of the electroweak theory are completely different from those of, uh, of Fermi's theory. Okay, here we also expect something similar. So, in this case, we have to keep these things. Now, uh, we find several interesting things. For instance, let me mention only the most important one. The phase shift which previously was divergent, you see, uh, for instance, in four dimensions, at b equals zero, you, you get this log of zero, which is infinite. Uh, instead, after you include all these corrections, the b goes to zero limit in this regime is tractable. It has a smooth expansion, you see, actually, in b squared over ls squared log s, and its derivative respect to E gives a well-behaved time delay even all the way to B goes to zero. This solves a potential causality problem which was pointed out in a paper by Maldacena et al. And uh, for full details of how that works, <coughs> I refer you to a paper by myself and uh, three collaborators. Uh, Another very interesting thing is that, well, there is a maximal deflection angle. You see, if you take Einstein's formula, the deflection angle starts to uh, become order one and then seems to blow up. Of course, that's when you expect to form black holes. In this case, the maximal deflection angle is, uh, is this. And since we are in the regime R less than L string, in this string regime, uh, this angle is smaller than 1, so there is a small maximal deflection angle. It is rich when the two strings graze each other, okay? they barely touch each other. And then what we found also is that, at least from this experiment, we cannot probe, explore distances that are shorter than the string length. And this led to the so-called generalized uncertainty principle, which I'd like to call effective uncertainty principle, because we don't modify the rules of quantum mechanics. But effectively, when you do your experiment, you find that the distances that you can probe are not just the ones you expect from the uncertainty principle. There is an additional term which grows with delta p, so that the delta x is always bigger, you know, when you have something like x plus 1 over x, there is a, a minimum, okay? And so that minimum, not surprisingly, is still the string length. Finished? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, yeah, now the last topics I do very quickly. Um, so I told you very nice quantum effects, finite size, spinning massless particles and so on. There are less desirable quantum effects. For instance, classical things can move in any ambient space-time, flat, curved, any number of dimensions. But quantum strings are much more demanding. Uh, they need some suitable space-time or more generally backgrounds in order to avoid some what I call anomalies, which are 
sickness, you know, diseases. Now, and if you take the case of weakly coupled superstring theories, space-time, if it's also nearly flat, must have nine space and one time dimension. So, four-dimensional space-time is not an obvious consequence of string theory, quite the opposite. So, in order to reconcile this with observation, one has to assume that the extra dimensions are compact or at least invisible to non-gravitational interactions uh, as it is the case in some brain world scenarios. So this pushes quant so quantum mechanics, if you want, pushes string theory into what many of you must know is called Kaluza-Klein theory, extra dimensions that can be used actually to unify also gravity and um, engage interactions, but it does so in a very interesting way. Uh, of course, I, that would require a full lecture to talk about T-duality and the emergence of non-abelian gauge theories and so on. And there too, this fundamental length plays an important role. For instance, the ratio of the size of your compact dimension and the string length is a very important dimensionless parameter. Uh, then I turn to what I consider perhaps the weakest point of string theory, which is that <coughs> it starts very beautifully because you say what are the parameters, you know, where are the parameters that I use in, in, in ordinary quantum field theory like masses, couplings and so on, what becomes of these parameters in string theory? Well, they are replaced by fields. So, uh, and typically are scalar fields, spinless fields. And uh, if you fix the value of these fields, then you fix, quote unquote, the constants of nature. For instance, the overall strength of string interactions is one such field. And its value would determine uh, the fine structure constant alpha. So, add the values of these fields determined by the dynamics? Well, who knows? Of course, if you compute alpha, you would have answered the dream of theories. Now, these constants look to be space-time independent today. Thibault has done beautiful work on putting bounds on their time variation. Now, uh, but for instance, they could have varied in the early universe, who knows? <coughs> and uh, for instance, a scenario, a cosmological scenario in which I have been working, uses very <coughs> strongly variations of uh, the scalar fields. Now, but there is a danger. If the particles associated with these fields are too light, or even worse, massless, <coughs> then they will induce long-range forces. And these long-range forces typically violate the equivalence principle of the universality of free fall. Okay, this is a, still, I believe, an active field of experimental and theoretical research to detect whether there are some long range, where long may be a millimeter, <laughs> A long, long, long range new forces. And for the moment, as far as I know, nothing has been found. So, but it's again to repeat my previous observation you don't need very, very high energy physics, Planck scale experiments for testing string theory. And this is, was true, as I mentioned already, for the old Adronic string. In fact, if you take at face value three level, so string theory at the lowest order approximation, it has plenty of these massless fields and it, it would violate the equivalence principle, would be uh, completely contradicted by the experiments. So you need to solve the theory beyond three levels, otherwise it's already ruled out. But let me point out that also the standard model is, is ruled out if you don't include phenomena like quark confinement and so on. So, in the last slide, and I have no conclusions, 
um, is string gravity and singularities. This is something I, you know, I feel very, it's very important. It's one of the most difficult, but perhaps one of the most fascinating questions in string theory is the fate of general relativity singularities, the Big Bang, black hole interiors, and so on. If you solve the, if you look at lowest order in the derivatives, which means large distances, and in the coupling of strings, then the equations that one has to solve in order to ensure a consistent string quantization look exactly like classical field theory equations. So partial differential equations, which include, with some slight modification, Einstein's equation. And like Einstein's equations, they satisfy the conditions for the singularity theorems of Hawking and Penrose. So that means that if you really stick to those equations, you'd predict that there are singularities. But of course, this is only valid in string theory at lowest order. But it's enough, the, the singularity theorems are enough to tell you that the solution is typically driven towards high curvature, strong coupling, or both. And, and then the approximations break down. So a big question, which I don't have any answer to, which are the correct equations in those non-perturbative regimes? What happens? happens when we're in a situation where there used to be a singularity according to general relativity. Can we go through this would-be singularity and keep predictivity? I think we badly need techniques uh, to study string theory non-perturbatively, both for these short distance problems and for the large distance problem of the massless particles. So with this, I think I stop. Okay. <coughs> Open the yes. discussion. We cannot do the discussion. So. Gabriele, you promised to explain why black hole and big bang singularities are very different. Can you say this? I, I promise to... Yes, in the beginning of the talk, you said the are oh, 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 No, no, I didn't mean, I didn't, I didn't mean that. Uh, that, that they are, it was not, no, it was not a question of uh, fundamental difference. Uh, I said that uh, the Big Bang singularity, you can find it by integrating backward our Einstein's equations from today's physics uh, back in the past. In the okay, so the difference is mainly one is a singularity in the past, in our past, and for the black hole singularity, it's a singularity in the future evolution of some initial data. I only meant that. And um, uh, but no, otherwise they are, they are quite similar. In fact, I mean, the difficulty is precisely to approach singularities which are technically called space-like singularities. So, like, they happen on a surface of constant time, okay? They're called space-time singularities. And I remind people that the singularity in the interior of a black hole is also of that type because the radial coordinates is actually becoming timeline inside there. So really the, the singularity at the center of the black hole is like a big crunch singularity. So in that sense they are very similar. One is a big bang, the other is a big crunch. And the question is whether in string theory you can avoid. Probably if you can avoid one, you can also avoid the other. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, then uh, I don't know about this. Uh, uh, how how you resolve the similarities in string theory? Uh, generally, so uh, if I'm not mistaken, this uh, generally string singularities don't 
uh, always uh, come up with blown curvature tensor, something not like that. Mm -hmm. it's geo geodesically incompleteness means the ger genetic singularities of Roger Penrose Hawking. So I don't understand from your talk that how can you resolve those means geodesic incompleteness theorems uh, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. string theory. So yeah, well, uh, no, I, I, I see what you say. Uh, our attitude is somewhat different, namely. Uh, uh, we prepare an initial state in Minkowski space-time, which is so far in the far past there are these two strings which come closer and closer, and then they start to interact. Now, we, okay, if you take a strict S-matrix approach, you're not trying to say, what if I measure <coughs> the gravitational fields here, there, and so on. You only want to look at whether the final state that you get at late times is consistent with a unitary evolution, which means it preserves the pure nature of the initial state, so it preserves information. Okay? You see, in, uh, in, in, uh, in quantum mechanics, you are supposed to do so. So if you start with two states which are orthogonal to each other, you should produce final states which are orthogonal to each other. Now, and, uh, but we don't ask questions like, you know, what if I go inside the horizon? We don't even talk about the horizon. No, I didn't ask that. I, I said that uh, this, uh, specifically the singularities of generativities are of incompleteness of... Yes, that's the, right. This is the way they are usually formulated, yeah. So, uh, how do you actually resolve them? Uh, uh, well, because, you see, when you, when you do that, you, you, you do take a non-trivial space-time and you look at the geodesic completeness or incompleteness and so on. Here, certainly not in this... You can perhaps ask me that question in the context of cosmology. If I do <coughs> some, some cosmology, I put some background and so on. And there I do have some answer, because in our scenario, this pre-Big Bang, the initial conditions are very simple and there is no <coughs> geodesic incompleteness in the past. However, and that's the point, you, ha you have to pass through a big Bang singularities, uh, <coughs> but there is no asymptotic difficulty. But, okay, the, so there is a trade-off. If you are doing inflation, for instance, there is this problem of initial conditions, eternal inflation, and so on. Uh, but then, okay, uh, the rest, the end of inflation is relatively simple, if you call simple reheating the universe after inflation. In our case, we have an easy life in the asymptotic past, no geodesic incomplete and so on, but then the price to pay is to know how you bounce from a collapsing phase into an expanding phase. By the way, collapse and expansion all depends on which metric you use, because if you want to have a metric in which the string size is constant, the string length is constant, then actually our scenario is a is, a, is an expanding universe all the time. There is no contraction. But if you use another metric, then it will be like a bounce. So just, I, think there is a funny yeah, yeah, I just have a follow-up, just yeah, so yeah, to clarify yeah. one thing. <coughs> so first of all, uh, in my talk on Thursday, I'm going to give several examples of singularities in general relativity which are resolved in string theory. So you'll see it. But one sort of beginning comment is that the definition of a singularity is different in string theory. Geodesic incompleteness is based on the fact that you want a point particle to be able to evolve for arbitrarily long times. In string theory, you should ask if a string yes. can evolve for arbitrarily long yes, times. Yes. That, al that already gives you some differences because conical singularities <laughs> lead to geodesic incompleteness, but because the string is an extended exactly. object, it goes right through conical singularities with no trouble. That's so a very good point. Very good point. Okay. Um, let me uh, sort of uh, uncharacteristically of myself make a, a, a question in defense of string. 
Thank you. <laughs> uh, you ended up uh, in, a, in a very sober uh, uh, last. I will reciprocate. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> no, in a very sober last night, in, in which you said, well, uh, we need an understanding non perturbatively. But in the last years, we have heard a, a lot via, in particular, IDF CFT, uh, uh, ideas of how to deal non perturbatively. Yes. Uh, so I guess the question is do you yeah, have yeah. assessment of that? Or you well, sh should we take your final line as an increase? No, I, uh, yeah, okay, I didn't have time to go into that, of course. Uh, in, some, in some cases, by now, we have this tool of ADS. CFT. I didn't want to enter into this because I thought it was a bit too, too technical, but I'm sure I have seen some of the titles will we'll touch on that. The problem is that the, the kind of situations which seems to be mostly relevant physically are a situation in which the background, the geometry, is, is, uh, is is time dependent, high curvature, and so on. And so, technically speaking, it would break supersymmetry spontaneously. So even if you start with a supersymmetric, and in fact you should start with a superstring, uh, the, the background would break supersymmetry. And then most of the techniques which people know how to use <coughs> seem, to f seem to fail. So I guess that in order to answer the relevant question physically, we are still, we still need better <coughs> tools. On the other hand, I, I have always in mind the, the, the possibility that at least ADS-CFT should help us to resolve some situations like the one we are talking about, because, okay, for the audience benefit, okay, this uh, gauge gravity duality connects typically a strongly coupled string uh, um, gauge theory to a semi-classical or weakly coupled gravity theory and vice versa. So most of the applications so far have been in the direction we use an easy problem in gravity to solve the hard problem in gauge theories. But why not uh, uh, to do the, the opposite? And I'm sure there are papers doing that, but I don't think some very clean answer has emerged using gauge theory in the weakly coupled regime to understand what happens when the ADS radius shrinks to zero, which means very high curvature. What happens to string theory, uh, to gravity in that case? So. I agree with you. I mean, at least we should learn some lessons. Maybe they're not enough to solve the real problems and so on. On the, on the other hand, I think on this bounce, uh, we, we share with uh, loop quantum gravity some optimism, right? If I understand correctly. <laughs> okay. um, two questions about the strings scattering you described. One is just basically, I think, a misunderstanding. Um, it seemed like you were saying the tidal effect was captured by string loop effects. Uh, no, mm, not really. Um, if I go back, no, I don't think we can... Well, at some level, my diagrams are all string loops, okay? Even before you put in the... Uh, the string size corrections, these ladder diagrams. Maybe right, yes, yeah, so this is why it's an elementary question I'm asking. How do I see that that's a classical effect, <laughs> even though there are loops in there? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, <coughs> somehow it's how classical <coughs> physics emerges from a loop calculations. In fact, let me say that the loops are absolutely essential, namely, if you take the string string scattering amplitude at three level, no loops, then you know it's modestly my <laughs> formula of 1968 or its generalization by Virasol. Now that formula has two big diseases. It has it grows with energy too fast. 
So if you take the partial waves, okay, you go to impact parameter, you go to partial waves, it violates uh, partial wave unitarity. It's too big. And if you want, it's too big in the forward direction, roughly speaking. On the other hand, if you go to fixed angle, namely high energy and uh, 10 degree <laughs> angle, it's too small. Uh, it's too small where you expect to have, <coughs> day, uh, to have events because of the gravitational deflection. So, uh, so the, the tree level is completely off. Both is, is too large in some cases and too small in other cases. And this reflects the fact that the theory is very soft. Okay, so it, it does not allow for hard processing in which the two particles deflect each other. So this was actually our very, very original motivation in 87 to look into this. And I think Michael Green was the one who, who pointed out this, uh, the, the, the unitarity bound vi violation. And we started to under look at that and say, well, how can we recover? Well, let's add loops. Now, it's a little less clear how, uh, mm, <coughs> let, let's put it this way. These are loops if you keep the two fast string lines in the Feynman diagram. If you replace them by sources of gravitons, then there are three diagrams. And in fact, all the corrections <coughs> which, uh, uh, I think this is worth, uh, let's see, yeah, uh, yes, this is the deck. Uh, these corrections, which we took into account for the, for the gravitational Bremsstrahl, for instance, these corrections are also given by three diagrams <coughs> if you remove these lines and you replace them by some little sources, okay? Now, the leading the leading iconal approximation, which is this one, comes when actually it's not only a tree diagram, it's a completely disconnected diagram, because if you remove the external lines, these are just propagators non-interacting. And the classical corrections, they come technically from letting these gravitons interact through a tree diagram. So if you remove the fast lines, and you let the gravitons interact at three level, you get all these corrections. And this is what in uh, 2007, <coughs> with Amati and Cefaloni, we tried to do in some approximation using Lipatov's uh, uh, effective Lagrangian and so on. And then, by solving this truncated theory, we arrived at some estimate of this critical line for collapse. Namely, we found the singularity. Now, however, <laughs> indeed, we cannot see unitarity being restored on the other side of this singularity line. But it was done precisely in this approximation, in which you let these gravitons reinteract, but not forming loops. If you form a loop, then I think you are adding this kind of correction. And it Whereas the, three, the string size corrections do not have loops. They are the same ground. The only thing you say, well, I have to be careful. This is an extended object. So remember, I had this diagram where I had these two circles, and the gravitons were exchanged between one point on the <coughs> string and the other point. But it was still the same topology of diagram. The only thing is that if you want this, this little blob, became somewhat bigger. But it's not a loop, it's a string. Okay. I don't know. There was the, one the, one the other half of my question was just what you just ended on. So you talked a lot about two of the regions in the plot of impact parameter and, and Schwarzer radius, but we you didn't talk about the yeah, strong gravity part and black <laughs> hole formation. <laughs> yeah. Um, is it like why can't we just dive in there? Um, is it just because it's computationally completely it's impractical? Compl well, as I said, the, the most we could do is, was, because, okay, the, the idea is that you don't have, at least 
go across this, uh, this line, you don't have to appeal to quantum gravity corrections which are controlled by the Planck length. You can just live with these three diagrams. So uh, this was precisely the aim of our paper uh, now 20 years ago. No, uh, 10 years ago, sorry, 2007. Uh, so um, as I said, if you take the three diagrams and you make a, a rather drastic approximation, somehow you freeze out some degrees of freedom and you keep only some. So you reduce this theory from a four-dimensional to a two-dimensional theory. Magically, okay, we, we get a hint of a singularity, namely some solutions of that, you know, when you sum three diagrams, this I'm a little bit technical, is like solving a classical field theory. Now, you look at classical solutions which are both real and regular. Why real? Because otherwise you, you lose unitarity right away. Why regular? Well, because otherwise everything blows up when you put this solution back into the action. And now we found that all the way approaching this now, we did it only in the case in which we neglected the string. So, say we are here, okay? Say very far, but here. Neglecting the string length, but keeping terms which go like r over b to some power. So, r over b becomes about the 1. That means what happens? Is there a critical point? Yes, there is in the sense that the real regular solutions exist only uh, when this ratio is less than something, okay? And uh, this two-dimensional theory, which uh, is already an approximation to the true one, was solved numerically by Marchesini and Donofri, and they found the critical value. Now, these critical values are all the time come out consistent with some upper or lower bound which come from the classical considerations. You know, there are these collapse, they always come consistent, but typically a factor of two or three off. Off the bound, so there is no actual yeah, yeah. problem. However, we don't understand what happens inside. I because think that we should yeah, uh, maybe stop, stop for now. Uh, but since there is um, the big ball talk will not take place this afternoon, so we, maybe we can have a round table and with all the speakers and all the questions that we couldn't ask now, we'll, we can do it in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So now we'll have a coffee and maybe a short. Of the